Good evening. Thanks for joining us tonight for the first presentation in our Meet the President's Lecture Series. We have a very special guest here with us tonight. Please join me in welcoming President Theodore Roosevelt. Good evening. How are you this evening? <laughs> Good evening. Good evening. Good to see all of you here this evening. <laughs> well, I am Theodore Roosevelt, your 26th president, and I am delighted to be with you tonight in Midland, Michigan. I do wish to offer an apology, however. Mrs. Edith Roosevelt was supposed to be with me today, but she has taken ill, nothing very serious, but she is unable to be with us this evening, so you have to put up with me. <laughs> But I am delighted to be back in Michigan. My first trip to Michigan was in Detroit in 1896 in October. I was campaigning for President McKinley against that populist candidate, William Jennings Bryan. I, my last trip to Michigan was again in Detroit, and that was in May of 1918, as I spoke about what the United States was putting forth to beat the Hun in Germany. And I was campaigning to get war bonds sold. Well, tonight, I would like to share a few stories of my life. And at the end, if you have any questions, I would be delighted to answer those. I was born October 27, 1858, in New York City. As a young lad, I developed the dreaded disease of asthma. Have any of you ever suffered from asthma? Ah, I see a few hands. In my day, we did not have the remedies you have available today. You have the inhalers. In my day, the scientists recommended smoking an entire cigar at one sitting. Another remedy that my father researched to find a way to help me was sipping black coffee. I am not certain if that worked, but I drink a gallon of coffee a day. Another remedy my father attempted was having our surrey, our buggy, hitched to the horses. I was wrapped in a blanket and held, and my mouth was open, and we would race over the cobblestone streets of New York City. Air would be forced into my lungs. It was not successful. Eventually, at the age of 11, my father sat me down and said, Theodore, you have the mind, but you do not have the body. In order for the mind to go as far as it will, you must make your body strong. I said, I will make my body, Father. We turned the upstairs piazza of our home into a gymnasium. I worked with barbells and weights, parallel bars and rings. I rode boats. I exercised. And at the age of 22, while I was in Europe, I climbed the Matterhorn Mountain. It had only recently been conquered by men. I climbed to the summit and back without one problem from the asthma. Now, as a sickly child, I could not attend the public schools. I was tutored at home by my aunt with my siblings and a neighbor, Miss Edith Caro. One of my earliest memories of Miss Caro, it was April of 1865. Abraham Lincoln had been assassinated. My father had worked with President Lincoln to help the soldiers of the state of New York. On the day of the funeral in New York City, Miss Caro, my younger brother Elliot, and I were in the second floor of my grandfather's home. We were watching the bands playing the dirges and the soldiers marching mournfully along. Miss Caro, at about three and a half years of age, was overcome by sadness. She began to sob hysterically. My brother Elliot and I looked at each other and we knew what we needed to do. We walked over to her, picked her up, put her in a closet and locked the door. <laughs> we wished to observe the procession in peace. She later forgave me for that and I'm thankful. But in our home, we had a vast library. Before I could read, I latched on to a ponderous volume of Livingstone's Travels in Africa. I would carry this volume to the family members and ask them to read the words that were under the pictures. That sparked the love of nature that continues to this day. As the years progressed, 
I determined that I wanted to study nature as a profession, to be a naturalist. I went to Harvard College in 1876 to study na nature. I soon discovered that Harvard does not teach nature studies the way they should be taught, in the great out of doors. They teach you in a closed-in room very similar to this, and you examine tissue specimens under a microscope. That is no way to study nature. My major became still part of natural history, but government as well. Now, while I was at Harvard, I had one of the greatest tragedies of my life occur. My father, Theodore Roosevelt Sr., the greatest man I've ever known. He's also the only man I was ever afraid of. I was not afraid of him physically. I was afraid that I would disappoint him. My nickname for him was Greatheart. My father died suddenly my sophomore year. He died of stomach cancer. The man who had given me life, who had given me breath, was gone. I've always believed, as President Lincoln believed, that if you have tragedy in your life, you can make the pain stop throbbing as much if you throw yourself into your work. So I returned to Harvard and I threw myself into my studies. Later that year, I encountered a young lady, Miss Alice Hathaway Lee of Boston. I courted her and she accepted my proposal of marriage and following my graduation from Harvard, we were married on my birthday in 1880. When we returned from Europe, I began to frequent the Republican headquarters. Party headquarters at that time, be they Republican or Democrat, were usually over a saloon. The men of the governing class were the saloon keepers, the carriage drivers, the rough men. It took those men a while to get used to seeing a gentleman in Brooks Brothers tailored finery. But eventually we became accustomed to each other. They asked if I would be willing to run for the state legislature in Albany from the district I lived in, the 21st district. We were known as the Silk Stocking District. I accepted and I was elected, the youngest assemblyman ever to go to Albany from our district. When I arrived at Albany, I quickly became known as the Cyclone Assemblyman. I would present bill after bill after bill to the floor of the assembly with the hopes of helping the citizens. During a recess in the assembly in 1883, I heard of a buffalo hunting region in the Dakota Territory. So in early September, I got on the train. Five days later, I stepped off the train, not onto a platform, but onto sagebrush. I was in the town of Little Missouri, Dakota Territory. It was the middle of the night, and as the train went off toward the Montana Territory, I could barely make out a large, shadowy building. It was the Pyramid Park Hotel. I went over, pounded on the door. The proprietor, Captain Frank Moore, he answered, and with much cursing, he showed me to the upstairs room. There were 14 cots. 13 of them were occupied by cowboys. So I threw down my gear, and the next day, I went looking for a man to take me on my buffalo hunt. All of the cowboys were reluctant to take an eastern dude on a buffalo hunt. You must imagine my appearance in the Dakotas. I knew how cowboys dressed. I had a large sombrero. I had a buckskin shirt with fringe and embroidery, buckskin gauntlets with fringe. I had a belt buckle custom made by Winchester, a sterling silver hunting knife custom made by Tiffany and Company, pearl-handled Colt revolvers with my name engraved on the grips, seal skin shaps, alligator skin boots, silver spurs. But the worst part of my attire, my spectacles. Cowboys viewed spectacles as a sign of a moral deficiency. I eventually convinced a man named Mr. Joe Ferris that he should take me on the buffalo hunt. We set out from his brother Sylvain's ranch, was the Chimney Butte Ranch, or the Maltese Cross. We set out for 10 days from that ranch into the wilderness. Finally, on the 10th day, we had our buffalo. When I returned to the camp with my prize, I asked Joe's brother Sylvain what it would cost to go into the cattle industry. 
He told me it would spoil the looks of $40,000. I thought about that for a moment and wrote a check for $14,000 as a down payment and became a Dakota rancher. I then returned east. I continued my terms in the assembly. And in February of 1884, on February 12th, while I was in Albany, I received a telegram that my wife had given birth to our daughter. There was much celebration on both sides of the aisle. Later, though, I received a second telegram, which caused me to race out of Albany on the train down along the Hudson River back to New York City. When I arrived at my home, my brother Elliot, he's usually a cheerful man, he greeted me with, there's a curse on this house, mother is dying, and so is Alice. I entered the home and discovered my mother was indeed dying of typhoid fever. My wife was dying of Bright's disease, a kidney disease that had been masked by the pregnancy. In the early morning hours of February 14th, St. Valentine's Day, I lost my mother as I sat at her bedside. And later that afternoon, I lost my wife. I have always kept a diary, ever since I was a young lad. On that day, the only thing I could bring myself to write was a great X, and the light has gone out of my life. I went through the automatic motion of the double funeral, we had the baby christened Alice after her mother. Then I left my daughter with my sister, Bammy, and I returned to Albany and I threw myself into the work of the assembly. When my term ended in June, I told my family, black care rarely sits behind a rider whose pace is fast enough. I was determined to go back to my ranch and outrun the cloud of gloom that had overshadowed me. So again, leaving my daughter with my sister, I headed west. When I arrived at the Maltese Cross Ranch, I discovered it was not the place for healing and solitude that I desired. We were along the Mata Hay Trail, a great cattle driving trail. The custom of the period was, if a cowboy came by your ranch, you had to offer him food, drink, and conversation. We had about seven cowboys a day stopping by the ranch. That does not leave time for solitude. I began looking for a more remote location. I headed north along the Little Missouri River. I came to a great grove of cottonwood trees. In the midst of the grove were the skeletons of two bull elk. They had battled to the death with their antlers intertwined. I called the area the Elkhorn Ranch, and I summoned two old friends from Maine, Bill Sewell and his nephew, Wilmont Dow. They are excellent Maine woodsmen, and I'm a fair hand with an ax. They came and began cutting down the cottonwood trees to build my cabin. On one occasion, I have decided to help them. At the end of the day, one of the cowboys asked Mr. Dow how the day had gone. They did not know I was listening. Mr. Dow said, well, Bill, he cut down 53 trees. I cut down 49. The boss, he beavered down 17. I can tell by your laughter, you know that was not a compliment. We eventually had a delightful ranch house. And as a ranch owner of two ranches, I would never ask my men to do anything I was not willing to do myself. One of the most mundane tasks on a cattle ranch in the Dakota Territory was at night you would release some of the horses so they could forage for their own food. The next day you had to follow their trail and retrieve the horses. On one occasion, I followed the trail of a very wandering horse who went clear into the Montana Territory. It was now evening. It was cold. I needed a place to stay. The only room available was over a saloon. I was reluctant to enter, and even more so when I heard gunshots coming from within the saloon. But I entered, and there was a drunken cowboy shooting at a clock on the wall. I walked in hoping to not be noticed. He saw me. First thing he said was, Four Eyes is going to treat the next round of drinks. I went over and sat by the stove and began to warm my hands. He followed me in a drunken stagger and said, I said Four Eyes is going to treat. 
I stood up. I looked past him toward the bar as if I was going to buy the drinks. I said, if I've got to, I've got to. But then I turned violently. I caught him with a great right to the base of the chin, followed by a left and another right. Both of his guns discharged. The bullets flew by. He fell back, hit his head on the bar, and knocked himself cold. <laughs> we put him in a shed that night, and he was ridden out of town on a freight train the next day. My nickname, at 25 years of age, was Old Four Eyes, a term of endearment from the cowboys. There are many other stories I could share about my time in the Dakotas, but I have many more years to tell you about. But I went back east at various occasions, and I had told my sisters, under no circumstance should you allow my friend from childhood, Miss Edith Caro, to be in the home when I come to visit. Sisters don't listen. I came to the home, and who should be coming down the stairs but Miss Edith Caro? I began calling on her. We began courting. In November of 1885, we were engaged. And on December 2nd, 1886, we were married at St. George's Cathedral in Hanover Square. When we returned from the honeymoon, I heard of a disastrous winter that had struck the Dakota Territory. I raced west and found to my horror that I had lost over 70% of my 4,000 head of cattle. I wrote back to a friend that I'm bluer than indigo. I made sure the men were established on the ranches, then I returned to the east. And in 1889, I was appointed by President Benjamin Harrison to be the Civil Service Commissioner of the United States. In that post, I was to fill government positions. I did not wish to fill them with only men, I filled them with men and women who were qualified for the jobs. It used to be based on your party affiliation. I spent six years in that post. And then in 1895, became the president of the board of the police commission of New York City. When I entered that post, you could buy a sergeant's position or a lieutenancy for a certain sum. You would get that back tenfold in bribes from the corrupt bosses. That is not the way it should be. I was able to change that police force and make it one of the most efficient and least corrupt in the world. In 1897, I became the Assistant Secretary of the United States Navy. I believe, as George Washington believed, the most effectual means to promote the peace is to be prepared for war. No great nation can be a great nation without a strong military, and in particular, without a strong navy. I was able to strengthen our Navy, and during my time as Assistant Secretary, Spain was oppressing Cuba. We had many Americans living in Cuba, so we sent the battleship Maine to Havana Harbor. In February of 1898, the Maine exploded, killing 266 of our sailors. When the first reports came back to Washington, it was determined a Spanish mine had caused the explosion. That is an act of war. President McKinley and Congress would not declare war, but eventually they relented. And when they did, I resigned my assistant secretaryship and became lieutenant colonel of the 1st United States Volunteer Cavalry, the Rough Riders. We formed at San Antonio, Texas, under the command of Leonard Wood, a Medal of Honor winner. I am thankful our first nickname did not stick. When we were in Texas, they called us Teddy's Texas Tarantulas. <laughs> we trained as mounted cavalry, and when the call came, we took our 1,200 men, made our way across the south to Tampa, Florida, and found the most disorganized military campaign you can imagine. No one knew what transport any of the troops should be on. We did commandeer a transport called the Yucatan, and discovered there was not enough room for our men to take their horses. Some of the men in our regiment were cowboys. If they had to go 10 feet, they would get on their horse, ride the 10 feet, get off. So for them to not have a horse was a great hardship. We even discovered that there was not enough room to take all of our men. We had to leave 400 men behind. But eventually we made our way in the Armada, down to Cuba. We landed at Daiquiri. We pushed our way into the Cuban wilderness, 
And on June 26, had our first encounter with the Spaniards at Las Guasimas. We drove the Spaniards back. And on July 1, 1898, I was at the base of the San Juan Heights with the Rough Riders. Colonel Wood had been promoted to general. I had been promoted to colonel. They were Roosevelt's Rough Riders. We were taking heavy fire from the heights, the higher hill, San Juan Hill, and the lower hill, Kettle Hill. I did not wish to lose men in lack of action. I was determined to assault the heights without orders, but then those orders arrived. I led my men on horseback to the first barbed wire fence, riding my horse, Little Texas. I sent him to the rear, and then I led the men in the charge up Kettle Hill and repulsed the Spaniards from that hill. I then observed that the 71st New York, the 26th Infantry, the 9th and 10th U.S. Cavalry, and the other regiments were having difficulty taking San Juan Hill. So I told my men, let's do it again, follow me. I charged down the ravine, and I turned and looked, and there were about five Rough Riders with me. I had those men lie down. I went back to the crest and I said, are you not coming? Have you all become cowards? And they informed me they had not heard me. So I said, well, you can hear me now. Follow me. So we charged again and with all the regiments, repulsed the Spaniards and drove them back to Santiago, their capital. The war was effectively over. My men and I, though, were left to languish in a malaria-infested swamp. We petitioned the government repeatedly to bring us home. They would not do it. The volunteer officers and I drafted a round-robin letter. It was leaked to the newspapers. It is amazing how fast you can make the government work when you go over their heads to their bosses, the American people. They brought us home in short order to a quarantine camp, Camp Wyckoff at Montauk Point, Long Island. As we were there, I was approached by Republican leaders of the state of New York. They asked if I would be willing to run for governor. I thought about this for a bit and determined I would run. Now, during the campaign, I had Rough Riders with me frequently. They would announce my speeches with gunshots or bugle blasts. One of my sergeants, Buck Taylor of Texas, he gave this speech for me. Vote for my colonel. Vote for my colonel. If you elect him, he will lead you as he led us in Cuba, like sheep to the slaughter. <laughs> that was not the endorsement I desired. But I was elected. Now, as governor, some of the political bosses, Boss Platt among them, the leader of the Republican Party of New York, wanted me to clear all of my decisions with him. I was not about to do that. I did what I felt was right for the people of the state of New York, regardless of which party it affected. That angered Boss Platt. As the election of 1900 approached, he wanted to find a safe place for me out of New York politics. That safe place? Vice Presidency of the United States. I did not wish that position. Mrs. Roosevelt and I spoke about it. She said that the vice president was much like the groom at a wedding. No one even sees or thinks of him. <laughs> when the national convention was held for the Republican Party that year, there was one vote against me being the vice presidential nominee, my own vote. But I campaigned across the country in 1900, stopping in Michigan in a number of cities, and in Ohio and other states nearby, campaigning for the McKinley-Roosevelt ticket. We were elected. I was now vice president of the United States. I spent four days doing my official duty as vice president. Then the Senate recessed, and I was left to my own devices. I was in Vermont speaking in September of 1901. President McKinley was in Buffalo, New York at the Pan American Exposition. I received a telegram in Vermont that President McKinley, while shaking hands with citizens, had a crazed man approached with his hand wrapped in a bandage. Inside of that was a revolver. When the president extended his hand, the man shot the president twice. I raced to Buffalo, and the doctors informed me that President McKinley would recover, that to ease the tensions of the nation, I should join my family on a camping trip in the Adirondack Mountains. So I did. One day, I was climbing one of the mountains, 
A man chased us down 10 miles with a telegram. It informed me that President McKinley had taken a turn for the worse and that I needed to return to Buffalo immediately. I raced off the mountain in the middle of the night, made it to the rail station, went into Buffalo, and discovered that President McKinley had passed during my travel. I arrived dressed similar to this. So I had to borrow a suit of clothes from a friend, and I took the oath of office to become your 26th president, not in any way that I had ever desired. I was in the library of a friend, and I was filling a dead man's shoes. But I knew it would be morbid to dwell on that, so I threw myself into the presidency. One area I felt very strongly about was the conservation and the preservation of our natural wonders and our natural resources. Do you know when I became president, there were plans to take the Grand Canyon, fill in most of it, mine the rest, and build hotels around the rim? When I stood at the edge of that majestic canyon in 1903, I said, leave it as it is. The ages have been at work on it. Man can only mar it. And I was able to save it. I was able to add five national parks to the five that already existed. I added 18 national monuments, 150 national forests, 51 federal game preserves, 230 million acres of land so that future generations could enjoy Crater Lake, Mesa Verde, Devil's Tower, Sully's Hill in North Dakota. You could enjoy all of that. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> You can tell I am passionate about that. But you know, as president, I was not only concerned with conservation. I felt that if the trusts, the monopolies, controlled all of the railways, they could charge you whatever rate they wish. That is not the way it should be. I brought suit against the largest of those trusts, the Northern Securities Trust. We disbanded that organization, increased competition, and lowered the fares. And I angered quite a few men with that. And another issue I felt strongly about was a fast route from the Atlantic to the Pacific Ocean for our Navy. Up to that time, if we had to send ships to the one ocean to the other, they had to go around the southern edge of South America in some of the most dangerous waters of the world. I had to circumvent Congress to get the Panama Canal started for our nation. But had I not done so, I believe Congress would still be debating the Panama Canal today. Now, as 1904 approached, I wanted to be elected in my own right. So I campaigned and was elected by the largest popular majority up to that time. I continued the policies I had begun. And as 1908 approached, I wanted someone who would continue those policies. The man I chose? was my Secretary of War, William Howard Taft of Ohio. He was elected. Two weeks after I left the presidency, I headed to Africa for a year-long safari with the Smithsonian Institution. We sent back thousands of specimens. But as I left New York Harbor, J.P. Morgan, one of the men that I had angered greatly with the busting of the trusts, he gave a dinner party, and he gave a toast to the lions. May they do their duty. <laughs> they did not. I returned from Africa and heard that Taft was not continuing the policies I desired. He was listening to the bosses. So I campaigned in 1912 for the Republican nomination for president. When I arrived at the convention in Chicago, Taft, since he was the current president, could have his delegates seated, which took away all of the seats that I needed so I could have enough votes to become the nominee. I had won the majority of the primaries for the Republican Party, including Taft's home state of Ohio. I felt the nomination was stolen. My delegates and I stormed out of the convention chanting, thou shalt not steal. We then formed the Progressive Party and I was their candidate with Hiram Johnson as my vice presidential candidate. I campaigned across America and again through many parts of Michigan. But that college professor, Woodrow Wilson, won the election. 
and I was able to have more votes than Taft, but that's little consolation. In 1913, I was asked if I could come and speak in Brazil. They offered me an expedition. We could examine part of the Amazon. I wanted something more adventurous. So we eventually settled on Rio da Duvida, the river of doubt. With Colonel Candido Rondon of the Brazilian army, we explored an unknown river. Over the months that it took, it was rather ill-planned. We lost three men, one man drowned, one man went mad and killed another one of our men. We lost all of our canoes and our supplies. I lost over 50 pounds. I re-injured my left leg and had an infection, parasites in my blood, 105 degree fever, malaria. And if it had not been for my son, Kermit, who told me that if I passed down there, he would carry my body out of the wilderness. So I had to determine to fight to stay alive. If it had not been for him, I probably would be down there in Brazil, still. But we made it out, and the rest of the years I won't go into things start to go downhill after that. But are there any questions you may have for me? Anything you would like to know? Yes? Yes, I could either be president of the United States or I can control Alice. I can't possibly do both. So I chose to be president. No, Alice married Representative Nicholas Longworth of Cincinnati, Ohio. When they moved there, she became rather disenchanted with the town and called it Cincinnati. <laughs> she lived to be 96 years of age. She was known as the second Washington Monument. She would host dinner parties in her home in Washington, would invite high-ranking political candidates of both parties, sit them side by side, then ask very awkward questions. <laughs> but oh, she was very well read. She did inform Mrs. Roosevelt and I that if we tried sending her to a proper ladies' school, she would cause a great scandal. We knew she was capable. <laughs> but, oh, you're welcome. Yes. Yes. Kermit was, and I can tell you about all of our children if you have a few moments and don't mind. Our oldest, Ted Theodore Roosevelt Jr., he served in World War I and was an officer. Back then we called it the Great War. We did not think there would need to be a second one of that size. But he served and was decorated for valor. He was grievously wounded when a German poison gas attack blinded him and injured his lungs. And as he recovered in France after the war, he helped establish the American Legion, an organization that he wanted to be, to continue the camaraderie the men had experienced. He wanted it to be integrated. He did not wish it to be a separate organization with one race here and another race there. He felt very strongly about that. He was proud of my legacy of having Booker T. Washington to the White House to dinner. But Ted served in that war. And in World War II, he was a brigadier general at the beginning of the war. He had served in North Africa. One of his exploits, they came to a town controlled by the Nazis. Ted told his men, I'm going into the town. If I'm not back in an hour, give them all you've got. He rode into town on a half track with a dirty undershirt as a white flag. Not long thereafter, the Germans surrendered. He was also on June 6th the only brigadier general to land in the first wave of the assault with his men on D-Day. He led the men. They discovered they were a mile south of their objective. He, the men said, should we get back in the boat and go the mile? He said, no, we will start the war from right here. He led his men in a charge against the Nazis, came back, and under constant heavy fire throughout the day, directed the men in the material where to hit the Germans. At the end of the war, Omar Bradley was asked, what was the bravest thing you saw in the war? He said it was Ted Roosevelt on the beach on D-Day. Ted survived that day, but died a month later of a heart attack while serving with his men. He is buried at the Normandy Cemetery. Oh, no, that's fine, because Kermit, 
our son, also served in World War I, but with the British forces at first. He didn't think America would get in soon enough. I agreed with him. But he served, and he led an armored motor battalion in Mesopotamia, Iraq. At one point, they came to a town controlled by Ottoman Turks, and there were many wounded Turkish soldiers in this house. Kermit rushed ahead of his men, kicked open the door, and forgot to draw his service revolver. No, he pulled out his swagger stick, and he pointed it at the men and demanded they surrender. The Turks threw down their guns. Kermit was awarded the British War Cross for gallantry. He then served with the American forces and then served in World War II again with the British forces, but was discharged for his health declining and was sent to America and served at Fort Richardson, Alaska, where he eventually died and is buried there. He died in 1943. Our son, Archie, he was the first of our children who was wounded in World War I. When he was wounded, we received the telegram, Mrs. Roosevelt called for a bottle of her father's Madeira, which was kept in our cellar. She drank a toast and smashed the glass to the floor and said, that glass will never be drunk from again. We hope that none of our children would be wounded. Archie had been given 100% disability for his knee being destroyed by a German grenade. When World War II came around, Archie wanted to be back in the action. He petitioned my fifth cousin, Franklin, to let him be in the service. He said, we need the Roosevelt name in the action. And if I'm lost, it's not that much of a problem. I'm not that useful anyway. They sent him to the Pacific to fight the Japanese. He was very brave. At one point, they needed Japanese gun emplacements marked on a map. He commandeered a boat, stood in the bow, went into the harbor, and as the Japanese fired at him, he marked where the flashes of fire came from on the map. He was not hit. Later, he was leading the men inland when a Japanese grenade destroyed his left knee. He was given 100% disability for that wound. He is the only soldier in American history to receive 100% disability for the same wound in two different wars. <laughs> Our son, Quentin. Well, actually, I should mention Ethel first, my youngest daughter. She became known later in life as the Queen of Oyster Bay. As cantankerous as Alice was, Ethel was the opposite. Ethel lived her whole life in service to others. She was the first of our children to go to France in World War I. She served with her husband, Dr. Richard Derby, as a nurse, helping the wounded French soldiers. That started a 60-year career with the American Red Cross. When she had her official portrait done years later, she did not wear her fancy gown and pearls. She wore her Red Cross volunteer uniform. I am very proud of Ethel's service. Our youngest son, Quentin, our precocious son. If you've ever heard of the White House gang, you will know. I can tell by that chuckle that you've heard of them. When Quentin was about seven, he had a group of school chums who would visit the White House frequently and would be involved in mischief. Now, often I was with them in the mischief, but they would do things like shoot spitballs at the portrait of Andrew Jackson. They would ride the trolleys of Washington, D.C. and make hideous faces at the people in carriages as they rode by, which one day they did to me. So I stood up in the carriage and made the hideous faces right back at them. But then it dawned on me. The entire trolley of citizens was watching the President of the United States make faces at children. <laughs> they did many other exploits, but Quentin, in 1915, went to Harvard. And when America entered the Great War, World War I in 1917, he petitioned to have a leave of absence from Harvard so he could serve. He had my eyesight, which we did not know. He memorized the eye chart to get into the air service. He was then sent to France, and for about a year was a commissary officer supplying the front lines. Finally, in June of 1918, he was sent to the front with the 95th Aero Squadron. We found out later that the life expectancy of American pilots was two to three weeks. They were flying the old Newport 28, a French aircraft that the French refused to fly. But Quentin had his victory on July 10th when he shot down a German. And on July 14th, he was with his men when they were ambushed by seven members of von Richthofen's flying circus. Richthofen had been killed just 
before that. So the group was headed by Hermann Goering. We received a telegram at Sagamore Hill that said Quentin was listed as missing in action. I remember pacing the porch and saying, how will I tell Mrs. Roosevelt? A few days later, we received the notice from General Pershing, the commander of the American Expeditionary Forces, that Quentin had been shot down and had been killed by the Germans. They had given him a full military burial, but that does not ease the pain. The next day, I spoke at Saratoga, New York, for the Republican State Convention. And I, no one in the audience knew what had happened to Quentin. And I said that the bravest and the finest of our young men have laid their lives on the altar of freedom. And that those of us who remain, who have not been found worthy of the grand adventure, need to make in this place a better country for the men who went to war and for the families who sent those men to war. It was a dreadful thing to realize that my encouragement for one of my children to fight had led to their death. But I am thankful that Quentin was able to show what was in him before his fate befell him. But you can tell I'm a very proud father. So I apologize for the length of the answer. Mrs. Roosevelt usually says, I say in a paragraph what could have been said in a sentence. Yes. <laughs> the question was, is there a story that goes with the teddy bear? In November of 1902, I was in Mississippi. I had been invited for a bear hunt and a picnic. You cannot have both together. We had neither one successfully. We were unsuccessful, as I said, in the bear hunt, and they hired Mr. Holt Collier, a former slave who was the greatest bear hunter in the region. He said, Mr. President, I will get a bear for you to shoot. So on the appointed day, he took my friend, sat us at the edge of a field, and he went off with his dog. We waited. We waited. I do not like lack of action. I became frustrated and went back to camp. Not long thereafter, a bear went right through that field with Mr. Collier's dogs behind it barking. The bear was cornered in a swamp. It killed one of Mr. Collier's dogs, injured another. Mr. Collier did not wish to lose his best dog, so he went into the water and smashed the bear on the head with his rifle. He then had a man hold the bear tied with a rope and sent a runner to camp saying, Mr. President, there's a bear to shoot. Well, I grabbed my Winchester rifle and went running out into the wilderness expecting to find a bear on the loose. No, the scene I came upon would have been murder. Now, we had reporters with us. It's always good to have reporters with you rather than against you. And I said, I will not shoot that bear. They sent that back to their newspapers. A man named Clifford Berryman drew a picture, not of a 250-pound bear as she was, but of a baby bear tied with a rope and called it Drawing the Line in Mississippi. That cartoon spread throughout the nation. Toy manufacturers such as Steiff and others, who had been making stuffed bears, started calling them Teddy's bear. So next time you see a teddy bear, it's the result of a failed bear hunt. But thank you for the question. Yes? What do you remember about the day you were shot? <laughs> Too much. The question was, what do I remember about the day I was shot? It was October 1912. I was in Milwaukee. I had exited the Gilpatrick Hotel. I was stepping into an automobile to take me to the auditorium. As I stepped, a man about six to seven feet away, named Shrank, came up out of the crowd with a 38 caliber revolver and fired it at me. The bullet slammed through my overcoat, through my coat, through my 50-page speech, through my iron spectacles case, and into my chest. The blow knocked me back into the automobile. And as a hunter, I know if you're shot in the chest, you need to check. If there's blood in your mouth, your lung has been hit. It could be a mortal wound. I checked. There was no blood. I made sure the crowd did not do any vigilante justice to Shrank, and then I told the driver, proceed to the auditorium and I will give the speech. It's amazing how fast you can make a crowd be quiet when you hold up a bullet-riddled speech and announce, I don't know if you understand, but I've just been shot. They chuckled a bit as well until I opened my coat and showed the blood stain that was spreading. I spoke for about 80 minutes, and at the end of that time, due to loss of blood, I was rather weak. They took me to the hospital. 
then by rail down to Chicago where they took an x-ray. At that point, Mrs. Roosevelt joined me. They determined the bullet was about an inch from my heart and inoperable. So I always jest that I carry the memory of Milwaukee close to my heart. But, yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. Well, what happened was 1912. He asked what happened with my relationship with William Howard Taft. What happened was 1912. I opposed the way Taft was being president. And words were spoken on both sides that were very hurtful. Eventually, we did reconcile. We were at a restaurant. And some of the people were rather anxious when they saw the two of us seated together. But then when we embraced and shook hands, yes, and when we embraced and shook hands, the whole place applauded and there were some tears. And President Taft, former President Taft, came to my funeral in January of 1919 and was the last person at the graveside as he stood there weeping. You hadn't spoken with him in years and years before they started speaking. That's right. There had been too many hard feelings. And Mrs. Roosevelt advised me against running in 1912. She said nothing but harm would come of it. And I've discovered, gentlemen, I'm more successful when I listen to Mrs. Roosevelt. <laughs> Although I am still a Dutchman and stubborn, so I sometimes forget to. <laughs> yes? Why was your uh, third-party campaign called Bull Moose? Oh, a reporter asked me. He said, how do you feel? I said, I feel as fit as a bull moose. And there we have the bull moose party. Which reminds me, if you ever see the photograph of me riding a moose in a river, a photographer took a picture of me on a horse and a moose in a river, and he cut that out, and they took a picture of it. That is not real. I have never ridden a moose. <laughs> that would be bully fun, though. <laughs> Are there any other questions? Yes? Yes. Yes, and a man who discovered that, Stephen Laurent, in the 1940s. Yes, mm -hmm, six and a half. And he asked about the photograph of me in the window during Lincoln's funeral procession in New York City. Stephen Laurent wrote a book in the 1940s researching every photograph he could find of Lincoln. When he found this photograph that showed the home of Cornelius Van Schaak Roosevelt, my grandfather, he thought, what's the chance that one of those dots in the window is young Theodore Roosevelt? So he went to Mrs. Edith Roosevelt, who was still alive, and she said, yes, that's Theodore, that's Edith, and there should be a third one there. And she told him the story of being locked in the closet. But, yes. So there really is a photograph of me with President Lincoln's funeral. And another tie I had with Lincoln, his personal secretary, John Hay, was my secretary of state. I would stop every Sunday after church and I would hear stories of President Lincoln. And on my inauguration in March of 1905, Mr. Hay gave me a ring with a lock of Lincoln's hair in it. But yes. Yes, sir. You had great skills as a negotiator the Russian Japanese. The Russo Japanese War, yes. Oh, yes. And my father believed that you needed to be honest in all your dealings, and so I was with the men. Plus, he asked about when I helped settle the Russo-Japanese War and with the 1902 coal strike, the anthracite strike. When I worked on those, I wanted to honor my father. When I made decisions, I would ask myself, what would President Lincoln do, what would George Washington do, and what would my father do? And I highly respected a man who was very honest and encouraged that in all of the children. But that settling the Russo-Japanese War was the hardest thing I did as president. The Russians sent the tallest ambassador I have ever met. The Japanese sent the shortest. They were the most stubborn men I have ever met. Off to the side, secretly, they would tell me, we will give this concession. But when I would present that concession at the table as my own idea, they would argue about it. At one point, we were on my presidential yacht, the Mayflower. I was so frustrated with those men, I walked out of the cabin and walked along the deck of that ship so that I wouldn't slam their heads together. But eventually, in 1905, we settled the Treaty of Portsmouth, and it was signed, and for that I was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. I think that was one of the hardest-earned Nobel Peace Prize. 
<laughs> awards, but yes, thank you for the question. Are there any other questions? Yes. She asked how I felt about the coming of World War I and the U.S. not getting involved. I pushed for us to become involved as soon as Germany invaded Belgium. I had worked with Kaiser Wilhelm, the leader of Germany. I had helped settle an affair with Venezuela that nearly resulted in war with Germany when I was president. I was also the only outside leader who was ever allowed to watch the German army and military maneuvers in 1910. So I knew how to work with the Kaiser to give him what he felt he wanted while we still got what we wanted. But Woodrow Wilson would not hear of it. He let Germany continue. So I helped raise military preparedness camps in America for our young men because I knew we would eventually get into that war. And all of our sons trained in those military preparedness camps. Even Mrs. Roosevelt, who is very quiet and reserved, she marched with a thousand other women in white dresses to help with military preparedness and to make the American people aware that we needed to be ready for that war. But you know, I think if I had been president, we wouldn't have had this big of a war. I would have settled that with the Kaiser. But what ifs? <laughs> what is your favorite book? Oh, what is my favorite book? I read about two to three books a day. I've always said a thorough knowledge of the Bible is better than a college education. And I enjoy that, but there are so many that it depends on the occasion and where you are. If you're riding the range in the Dakotas, watching cattle, there's a certain book you could read. When I chased the boat thieves in 1886 in the Dakota Territory, I read Anna Karenina by Tolstoy. And then when I read through that book, I found out one of the thieves had a dime novel of Jesse James's life, so I read that. But... Mrs. Roosevelt says she has a much more refined reading selection, and she does. But oh, I'm, there's quite a few. <laughs> I like a, the nearly 40 books that I wrote, so I recommend those. <laughs> well, Winning of the West, four volumes that I began work on when I was a rancher in the Dakotas. Yes. Are there any other questions? Yes. Um, do your children have any bad <laughs> Oh, I'm so glad Mrs. Roosevelt isn't here to hear this. Yes, we had many exotic pets. One of them, this is the one she can't stand, so please don't tell her I told you this. We had a journalist with us at breakfast one morning. I said, I wish you could see our son Kermit's cunning kangaroo rat. Kermit said, Father, I have the rat right here. And he opened his coat. The rat leapt out of his coat onto the breakfast table, hopped across the plates, came to me, I gave it a bit of sugar, then it hopped back across the plates and into Kermit's coat. Mrs. Roosevelt was not pleased that there was a rat on the breakfast table and less pleased that a journalist witnessed it. He later wrote about it. But don't tell her I shared that. But no, we had many pets. My daughter Alice had a pet snake. It was named Emily Spinach. Emily, after Mrs. Roosevelt's very thin sister, spinach because the snake was green. She wore it as a bracelet. She wore it as a necklace. She would carry it in her handbag. She would release it at state dinners at very inopportune times. We had Eli the macaw, Loretta the parrot. One of the birds would yell, hurrah, for Roosevelt. I like that bird. We had a one-legged rooster. We had Josiah the badger. He was a gift from a young boy in Wisconsin. I carried the badger on my lap in 1903 as I went across the nation. And when I let him loose, he would nip people's ankles. And our son Archie said, that's fine. He doesn't bite anybody on the face. But we had, oh, guinea pigs. We had snakes. You name it, we had it. We even had Algonquin the pony. This was Archie's favorite horse. Archie was sick with measles. His younger brother, Quentin, thought that Archie was sick because the adults would not let him out of his room so he could see his pony. So what did Archie? What did Quentin do? He went to the stable, got Algonquin by the halter, brought him into the basement of the White House, onto the elevator, brought him up the elevator, down the hallway to Archie's room. Archie recovered. I'm not certain of the medicine. I don't think all of the staff recovered because there was quite a bit of evidence following the whole trail. But no, when you mention pets, we might be here till tomorrow, so I'll just leave it at that. But Yes? 
I know, that's hard to talk about. No, I passed, and you don't often hear this sentence, I passed on January 6th, 1919 at 415 in the morning. The doctors determined it was a blood clot. I had been in the hospital since Armistice Day, November 11th, and I was released at Christmas and was told that due to the infection in my leg and rheumatism that I might be in a wheelchair the rest of my life. And I thought, that's fine. I can still get around and do what I need to do. But on January 5th, I told Mrs. Roosevelt, you never know how much I love our home, Sagamore Hill. And then I went to bed. 60, yes. And when I was at Harvard College, the doctor examined me, and he said, due to my asthma growing up, my heart was weakened, that I needed to lead a sedentary life, that I needed to have a desk job. I looked at him, I said, I will not do any of the things you said. I'll live to be 60, and whatever comes after that, so be it. I should have said I'll live to be 120. <laughs> but no, I was only 60, yes. Yes, sir. No, that was Taft. I didn't throw out a pitch for the baseball games, but I, I think it was Taft, if I remember, but yes. But my, my favorite sport was football, which I helped save. There were plans to destroy football and make it illegal because so many men were dying as they served on the gridiron. No, I cheered our son Quentin's baseball team, the Washington Invincibles. Just young boys, about 10 years old, their scores were reported in the newspaper. I was the loudest fan, but baseball's too sedate for me. Okay. Now, um, back to the Panama Canal. Yes. Oh, yes. France had started the canal in Panama. Our nation, many of our senators wanted another route. It was too far. There was not enough begun. I knew we could finish it. And so when Panama declared its independence from Colombia, I recognized Panama as an independent country which bought the full military weight of the United States behind the new nation of Panama. And that's where I circumvented Congress. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. No, and we needed a route faster than 60 days. You cannot spend two months when you're being attacked. You'll be destroyed. So for the safety of our nation, we needed the Panama Canal. Yes. Yes, the Food and Drug Act I passed. Yes. That was, many men had influenced me, including a book <laughs> by Upton Sinclair. And know that, I felt we needed it. When you opened a can of food, it needed to be what was in there. Not whatever wandered in. Are there any other questions? She asked what my proudest accomplishment was. I believe I'm more proud of my children's service to our nation than I am of having been your president. But as president, my proudest accomplishment, I believe, is the conservation of our natural wonders and resources. Many of my 18 national monuments became national parks. And I'm thankful for that. But thank you for that question. Well, thank you for being here this evening. If you do have any other questions or would like a photograph, I'll be down here afterwards. Thank you. <laughs> Good to see you here tonight. <laughs>